Uh, so the Lord bless you so much. We are again so grateful uh, for a couple of few minutes that we are going to have to address some of the things that pertain godliness and that pertain our salvation. We can just bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are so grateful. We pray that you should be our help this day. Stand with us, my Father, open our eyes, our heart, our innermost being, Father, to know the reason why things are supposed to be the way they are. Lord, help us, O oh Father, that we can approach Thee with all the reverence. We thank You in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. So the Lord bless you so much, and we hope that uh, every person is good in the land, and we hope that uh, yeah, God has been keeping you. Uh, maybe it's uh, it's been kind a while, but uh, all that the Lord will allow us to to know or to to have or to understand, we still thank God. And I believe that we people are getting acquainted with the Scriptures, for this is our purpose. Heavens and the earth, we shall never cease to speak, shall pass away, but the word of the Lord should never pass away. Where you go, where I go, the word of God remains one and the same, and we, we thank him for his word. So this day we want to run quickly to the scriptures, especially we want to address something in the scriptures, and uh, it's something like a question that I've had uh, quite so many people asking, and this question is to deal or with Malachi 4, I hope you people, especially those people who have been acquitted with the message of William Branham, you know that uh, what it is, what has been forming like a basis of worship amongst them, uh, is the reason of this Malachi 4 claim. So I want to, to go to it and see what actually the scriptures speak about it and uh, where we expect it, and this day I hope it will be a blessing. Now, you may not so much of uh, uh, agree with me, but it is fine. People may disagree, but let's take a closer uh, look on the scriptures, <clears throat> because the scriptures are sufficient, and uh, they will be able to speak. When you are not speaking, God is still speaking. When your churches have ceased, the word of God shall forever be. For it's written, heavens and the earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass. So if God has given the scriptures, if he has given his word, if he has communicated to us his, uh, his, uh, his will, that is through the scriptures, it behooves us to go back to them and uh, whatsoever we have builded upon Christ or whatever we, we think we are believing, it should be in harmony, in uh, good unison with the scriptures. So that's why we're going back to the scripture this morning. And uh, for our beginning, we have to understand that uh, we have to abide with certain principles. Uh, one of the principles of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. You know, the scripture says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we abide with. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And you remember we spoke some time back that in dividing the word of truth, the congregation wherein God is addressing does matter. Because God has the body of scriptures. They are all, they are all the word of God. But the programs of God do change. God does not change. But sometimes he changes his programs. One day he says, Israel, you are a people. Another day he says, I will cease to call them a people. Until maybe something is done. So our God programs are so many upon them, especially the program of the earth and the program of, of the heaven, the program of uh, restoring Israel, the program of uh, creating a new man, the program of uh, saving people, rather accepting the justification through the sacrifices wherein it was being offered, uh, the, the, the animals. Now the program changes, God has a better sacrifice, and that is Christ Jesus. So, in Christ Jesus, there is a program where, of course, Peter speaks about the spirit that was in the prophets, prophesies about the sufferings. The same spirit prophesies about the glorification, the first coming of Christ to redeem, now the second coming of Christ to reign. 
in power and in glory. So all these are programs in God. This is why we have to abide with the principles and uh, what the scripture is speaking to us. Now in the book of Timothy says, study to show yourselves approved unto God. You don't need to be ashamed when you're rightly dividing the word of truth. It's because uh, failure to divide the word of truth, so many shames are filled within the church. Now when you just go to the book of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 14, it says something. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. It is Paul admonishing his son, son Timothy that continue thou the things that thou hast learned of me. Because now, if you go to the scriptures again in the book of Timothy, Paul says God wanted to show the, uh, the, the pattern. Hmm? Of course, that in First Timothy chapter one verse sixteen say that have bait for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ must show forth all the long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him uh, to life everlasting. So there was a pattern, and Paul was a pattern to us, the body of Christ. And uh, therefore, when he says the things that thou hast learned of me, continue thou in them. There are things that we have learned of Paul and uh, the special the revelation of the mystery, the godliness that has been uh, opened, the way of salvation, according to the book of Titus, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Continue thou in the things that thou hast learned of me, Paul speaking to Timothy, and from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. What is the admonishing of Paul? From a child, Timothy, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Thou hast known the holy scriptures. You cannot do away with scriptures in whatever you're doing. So that's why we have to go by the scripture. And then he says, for all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be Perfect, thoroughly finished unto all good works. That's how the, 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 the use of the scripture is. According to Paul's uh, inspiration and revelation, he speaks every scripture is profitable. Whatever you read in the scriptures, it is all profitable. It is profitable for doctrine. It is profitable for reproof, for correction, instruction in righteousness. Now, all the scripture is profitable, but you will have to understand and agree. If you love the Bible, if you love to study the scriptures, not all scripture is calling for your participation. You ought to understand where in the scripture is calling for your participation, because not all is calling for your participation, though it is all called the scripture. For example, there are so many scriptures in the Old Testament, and they are speaking about, uh, for example, the, the cleansing of a leper. The offerings to be taken. How you ought to go to the priest and present yourself and be examined. All those are scriptures. They are profitable for instruction. You understand what God was dealing. How God's dealing was, was, was with the children of Israel. It is profitable in that sense. When he says, offer these sacrifices, these oblations, morning oblations and so forth. All those are scriptures. But you see, you're not called to participate now in that. Something higher has been risen, so that's why we hope to go to the scriptures, rightly divide them, understand wherein is your participation required. So when you understand where your participation is required, then the scripture becomes so good, the programs of God are no longer a problem to you, it is all profitable. It is in the scriptures that uh, Noah was instructed to build the ark to the saving of the souls. But you see now, when you take that scripture, it, it is profitable for instruction, uh, for reproofs, for correction. But now you see that scripture is not calling for you to participate in that order. You cannot just go now again and uh, you begin building the ark. Or like Moses, you begin uh, getting a, a rod and smiting a certain rock somewhere. You would have missed the whole program of God. You will not have uh, understood to really divide so that you can understand wherein is your participation required. So because of these things, that's why we have so many claims in the land. And that's where we want to go back in the scriptures to understand where God is calling us to participate in. So that before you call or you have a claim, especially you 
anti-messy believers, I think this should be for your help to those who want to be helped. They want to deal with Malachi for to understand what is Malachi speaking to? Whom is it addressed to? What is God speaking in that scripture? What is it that God is uh, communicating to the church? So this morning, we want to turn back to our scriptures so that we can learn where the scripture is speaking for our profiting in instruction, profiting in uh, correction, in reproofs, or it is the scriptures, the board of the scriptures, but you have to rightly divide. So you know what you have been called for to participate in. Now, in the book of Malachi, perhaps we shall read all the chapters so that we can uh, get the background, because I know one of the reasons that has been causing problems is uh, a person coming and uh, picking out a scripture amid so many uh, uh, scriptures and uh, perhaps uh, missing out the context of the address that God was uh, uh, intending to bring forth. So for this reason, the exonerating of the scripture, a uh, verse amidst other, other, other addresses, and then it causes it to have certain claims, and then uh, you miss out the whole thing. So I think it is good that uh, we should read the whole thing. So in the book of Malachi chapter 4, the Bible says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn us an oven, uh, and all the proud here, yeah, and all that to do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, say the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor, nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness rise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the sole of your feet in that day that I shall do this thing, says the Lord of hosts. Now verse 4 says, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant. The scripture says, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Holy for all Israel, with the statutes and the judgments. God is speaking, remember ye, the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and the judgments. Now we can just put some little comma there. We want to take our time, few moments, but a point upon another. When the scripture says, remember ye the law of Moses. You have to understand whom is this scripture being addressed. When you go to the scriptures, to the revelation of the mystery, the gospel that was given to Paul, which was kept since uh, sacred since the world began, Paul points out and says that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. In the book of Ephesians, he says, Christ nailed everything that was against us. Let me just uh, cap that thing for us. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, uh, If you just go, for example, from verse 14, For he is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of time one new man, so making peace. Now, if you get Paul, and get this statement that Christ has abolished in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances to make in himself of trying one new man. So making peace. And then the book of Malachi, it says, Remember ye the law of Moses. That must give us the understanding that it must be another congregation altogether being addressed. 
You cannot point this scripture of Malachi chapter 4 to a man whom God has given a program that the law has been abolished in the body of the flesh of Christ. All the commandments are the, the, the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances have been abolished. Now here the Bible says, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in all holy, with all the statutes and the judgments. So in the rightly dividing the word of truth, you have to understand which program, what congregation God is typically addressing. Now when he says he has abolished the law, it is fresh. Because Christ has been, uh, has got the, the enmity that was against us. He nailed it to his cross. The curse of the law. The curse, which was the reason of sin and disobedience by the reason of the law. For the Bible says, in the law there is the knowledge of sin. And the law was commanded, uh, was added because of transgressions. So therefore, the law is the strength of sin. Where there is no law, sin is not imputed. But the law was given as a schoolmaster to lead us unto Christ. But now that Christ has come, there is another righteousness of which the scripture speaks in the book of Romans. The righteousness of God, which is without the law, has been given. Now there should uh, should be something that should be clear to us to identify who is this people that God is addressing when he speaks and say, remember ye, who is this ye or who is this you? Remember you, the law of Moses. You remember it. Now he says, Christ is the end of the law and he has nailed the commandment that was against us, putting it on the cross, taking it in his flesh. And then abolishing it. The Bible says abolishing. If the something has been abolished, then the scripture does not call you to remember something that God himself has abolished. He has abolished the law contained in ordinances, in commandments, contained in ordinances, and then making peace in this one new man. Of course we said this one new man is Christ. Now he's addressing the people that remember now these statutes, these judgments. So it must come to pass that we should come to realize who is being addressed. When you go to the scripture, he promises a new covenant. In the book of Ezekiel and the book of Jeremiah he, and the book of Hebrews, he says, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And in this covenant, I'll take away a stony heart. I'll give a heart of flesh. I'll take away a wrong spirit. I'll give a new spirit. I'll also put my spirit within you. Then I will write my laws upon the trouble of your hearts. And I'll cause you to move within these laws. So when God is speaking to Israel, he gives them a promise that there is a new covenant. And in this new covenant, the blood should be shed to rectify the covenant with a better sacrifice, which now is Christ Jesus. And he makes a new covenant with the house of Israel. God is specific. With the house of Israel, I gave you the old covenant. Remember in the times when these people were given the old covenant, the scripture says, you were without God. Let's read that scripture. In the time of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, that in the time past, you were without Christ. Remember that is from, uh, from verse 11, let's begin. Wherefore remember that he being the time past, when you want to understand the scripture, you also ought to understand our time past and Israel's time past. The time past of Israel, they had a God. He was called the God of Israel. They had the fathers. They had the prophets. They had the covenants. They had all that pertains to the promises that God had promised. Because God said in the book of Hosea that you only have I known of all the house, of all the, the, the families of the earth. So God took one house and it was the house of Israel and from it he's supposed to bless the rest of the families. That was the program of God. Now in the time past, they had a God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. 
Then in that time, the Bible says, wherefore you remember that you bang uh, uh, genders in the time past, genders in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision. You was not called um, you was not called circumcision. Because circumcision was not given to you genders, it was given to them. Abraham received the sign of circumcision as a seal of his faith, his obedience, is the sign of his covenant. And it was supposed to be with Abraham and also as many as he would buy with his money or the strangers that would come within him and they admire the God of Abraham and this would be proselytes that would uh, convert to that uh, religion. So they would also be circumcised. Now once they were circumcised, they were also counted as strangers but then uh, believers. But that program was not including the body of Christ. Now, in the time past, you was called uncircumcision, and they were called circumcision, in the flesh made by hands. Then at that time, ye were without Christ. In the time past, when these people were given the covenants, you were without Christ, you Gentile, you Branham believer. In the time past, when they were given the covenants, you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were aliens from the inheritance of Israel, from the promises of Israel. You were aliens, meaning you were a stranger to those commonwealths of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. So when he says, remember the law, and the person was a stranger in the covenants of promise, how can God ever require you to remember something that he never gave you? That should be a question. Can God ever tell me that I should remember the law when he never gave me the law to remember? He gave the law to these people who had the God, who had the covenants, who had the promises. Having no hope, I was without hope, and without God in the world. So meaning, the time passed. You don't judge me by my time past. The time passed, I had no God. I had no covenants. I had nothing. So because of that one, I was a stranger, an alien, and an enemy of God. For this purpose, for he is our peace. What did Christ do? You were without God in the world, but now in Christ, you, have, you were sometimes afar off, a bed nigh by the blood of Christ. When Christ came, shed his blood, we are brought nigh. For he is our peace, Christ who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished the, in, the, in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments that, and, uh, that contained in ordinances for to make in himself our friend, one new man, so making peace. This is what Christ has done. Our time passed, we never had God. We never had commandments. We never had promises. We never had fathers. We never had prophets. We never had nothing in the time past. But in their time past, they had the promises. They had the fathers. They had the adoption. Christ came according to the flesh. They had all the things that would be found in the book of Romans chapter 9. How was the time past of Israel? Let me just read for you. In the time past of Israel, Chapter 9, the Bible says, I say the truth, verse 1, in Christ, and I not. My conscience also beareth me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I might have heaven, uh, that I have great heaviness and continue sorrow in my heart. For I would wish that myself was a cast from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. Paul, when he comes to the flesh, he says, These are my kinsmen according to the flesh, and they are Israelites. Remove your thoughts of replacement. The body of Christ has not come to replace Israel's promise. When you say that, then you are blind of the mystery of blindness. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the genders be coming. So all Israel shall be saved, as it's written, out of Zion shall come forth a deliverer, and he shall turn away and goodness from Jacob. When you say you have repressed Israel, then you are becoming a liar because you will tell me that what was told in Daniel chapter 9, 70 weeks are determined for thy people to make an end of sin, to anoint the most holy, to do away with iniquity. 
to establish everlasting righteousness that all things have not found their own place or rather will never be fulfilled. But because they will be fulfilled, all Israel that she called Israel is to be saved. The Bible says, the remnant has obtained and the rest were blinded until the time of Gentiles be done or win. So all Israel should be saved. Now the Bible says, for this reason, I could wish myself were a curse from Christ for my, uh, for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. Israel as a nation. Shall a nation be born in one day? As soon as uh, Zion travaileth, she brings forth. When the woman travaileth, she brings forth a man, child. Zion shall come back, the Bible says, to whom pertaineth the adoption. In the time past of Israel, they pertain the adoption by the reason of their fathers. They are beloved. They are enemies for your sake. But by the reason of their fathers, they are beloved of the Lord. But you never had the fathers. You are beloved because you have a position in Christ. Now the Bible says you have been accepted in Christ. Them are beloved for their father's sake. Now to them pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Whose are the fathers? And of whom concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. My friend, Israelites, you cannot tell him that he was not without God. God was for them. That's why even Christ, when he comes, he says, salvation is of the Jews. We worship what we know, but you worship what you know not, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is come, and now is when the Father seeketh not only the Jew to worship him, but he seeketh such as should worship him in truth and in spirit. This is what God is speaking according to the scriptures. Now, in the time past, they were with God. You were without God. They were with covenants. You were without covenants. So you cannot remember something that you never had, you Branham believer. So when he says, remember the law of Moses, it must be remembered by him who had the law. That's why for Christ to give us a position in God, he had to do our will the enmity. He had to do something with the enmity because you were a stranger to the law. You didn't know the diverse washings. You didn't know the cleansings and the consecrations. You couldn't approach God through a priest. You never had a priest to approach God for you. But he is now become the high priest of our confession wherein he has made in himself of trying one new man, abolishing the law of commandments that is contained in the ordinances. He has done with enmity that now you can be accepted because you are a stranger. If he should accept you according to the law, then you are of all the people miserable. Paul would say, foolish Galatians, who has bushed you, receive ye the faith by the works of the law. Is it not by the faith of Jesus Christ? For if by works, why should I yet suffer persecution? If I still preach circumcision, if I still preach the commandments and the, all the things, the things that I knew, I counted that it is nothing, that I should know one thing, Christ and him crucified. That's what Paul was given. Something that is diverse. My friend, you cannot get Paul's congregation and pin them over to remembering the law. That's my point. So when God says, remember ye, it is speak about Israel. To whom had the law? Whom had the prophets? Whom had the adoption? Whom had the giving of all this glory? And Christ came according to the flesh. That's why the Bible says, Though we knew Christ after the flesh, yet now no longer know we no man after the flesh. We cannot, my friend, know Christ after the flesh. When Christ was in the flesh, he called you dogs. But when he came in the spirit, he says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching them that nine and goodness we should live somebody acceptable before him in love. This is now our time past, their time past, and we're speaking about now. Today is the day of salvation. And this way you are, and that's why we want to uh, acknowledge rather to rest, rather to address you in. So when the Bible says, remember, then verse 5 says, Behold. I will send you Elijah the prophet 
Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Behold, I send you. Now I want to ask you, you Balaam's people. Who is the you that is being addressed in the book of Malachi chapter 4, verse 5? Behold, I send you. Unless you are able to understand who this you is, then you would always claim that those things were fulfilled by William Branham when it is nothing but a lie. But all I send you. This you must pertain to Israel, my friend. For you to remember the law, I must send you, Elijah the prophet. After all, the book of Malachi, for us to understand who this you is, we must go to chapter 1 and see to whom this burden is addressed. Chapter 1 of the book of Malachi says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. The very first address. The burden of the, of the word of the Lord. The prophecy of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. So when God sends a prophet, he sends him specific. He does not send anyone to go fathomlessly. He does not send so that when you reach there, you can know where you yourself want to go. That is not so with God. It may be so with Branham. For him being a gentile, Trying to say that with this little ministry that God has given me, I think it can be a blessing to Israel. So now he gets his ticket. He is over there in Egypt and is wishing to fly over to, to Israel to make a revival for them. To call the elders and then preach them so he can convert them. So of course he believes he is this you. He is this Malachi. That is not so with God. God is not the author of confusion. When he says the burden of the word of the Lord to is of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. God is specific. This word is about Israel. This prophecy, this burden is about Israel. That's why he begins with this principle part and says, he first expresses his love toward Israel and he says, I have loved you, say the Lord, and you say wherein hast thou hast loved? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, said the Lord, yet I love Jacob and hated Esau. When Paul captured this scripture, that God has loved Israel, when Paul, in the book of Romans, when he brings forth this scripture, that God has loved Israel and hated Jacob, he speaks it still concerning Israel. Because this burden is about Israel. My friend, you cannot get the burden of Israel, and then you point it over to the new creature. Certain things in the scripture, they need a real clear-cut division. You must rightly divide Israel from the body of Christ. Because the program of the salvation of Israel and the program of the salvation of the body of Christ, they are two different programs coming at the two different times, though with the same Savior. If not, then you will find you don't understand how even to rightly divide the Second coming of Christ. There is when he comes and it is a mystery. The Lord himself shall descend with a shout and we shall meet him in the air. And it is called the second coming also. But it is the mystery coming of Christ with a certain program. My friend, if you don't divide Israel from the body of Christ, then you will stand and say, teach the people that actually they are supposed to wait for Christ who should come in the clouds. For in the book of uh, Luke, um, Acts, I think, Acts chapter 1, when the scripture says, You men of Galilee, why you stand and gaze in the air? The same Jesus that you have seen taken out from me. In the like manner, he shall descend. They, he went out when they were viewing him. And he's supposed to descend and he, on the same mountain olives. Now when you teach the people to wait for the Jesus to stand and press his foot upon mountain Elves, Elves, Orvet, brother, you have missed your congregation. 
The church does not meet Christ on the mountain olives. He does not wait for him to appear so they can see him. The scripture says they meet him in the air. Perhaps you even don't understand what this air is all about. We may think that maybe he's supposed to come and that the air that is being described there, that it is this air which has clouds and past the moon, past the, 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 the stars. Brother, that is not so. There is another air where we are supposed to meet Christ. When the rapture takes place, my friend, we meet Christ in the air, and this air is not the air of this oxygen and gas that is being about. If you want to understand that air, you go to the book of the kings, and you saw Elisha, and his servant, and the enemies, the Syrians, are all camping around Elisha, and the scripture says, this young man fears, and Elisha tells him, Lord, open this young man's ears, eyes, and when the eyes are opened, he says, behold, there is so much about us, greater are they that is with us, than they that is with them, for when the air of the supernatural was opened to this young man, who was with Elisha, the Bible says he saw chariots, he saw the fires, he saw God, he saw the, 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 the hosts of God all around them. Brother, when it comes us meeting Christ in the air, this is the air that we are supposed to meet Christ in. That it doesn't matter where you shall be, it is just a matter of that this earthly motto shall put on immortality and then in the twinkling of an eye, we have stepped into that kind of air. The air where the angels are, the air that has come down by the reason of the mystery of Christ and shall never be lifted away until it has taken itself with it the body. This is the air wherein we are supposed to meet, the supernatural air. Not this earthly air that can be taken with pictures. But these people are supposed to meet Christ when he comes. Another congregation is supposed to receive Christ in the second coming of Christ and he comes on the cloud and every eye should see him. They that also pierced him, they should see him. So when you don't rightly divide Israel from the body of Christ, the body of Christ meets Christ in the air and will never be seen by any mortal man. The mortal eye, the veil of this fish, the camera, will never take a picture of a person being raptured. But there is a people who shall see Christ and all the nations should mourn. They are all the second coming of Christ. Why do we really divide the word of truth? So we can press people upon collect faiths. Brethren, the Bible says, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel. It is specific to Israel. So when he speaks, remember ye the law of Moses. Ye, it is still Israel. It is the, uh, the congregation is Israel who is being addressed. It is the one which is being addressed in concern. That's why if we should see John the Baptist coming, if he should come here, then he must specifically go to Israel. When John the Baptist comes, he must specifically go to Israel. Let me capture for you this scripture. Matthew chapter 3 from verse 1 In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand <clears throat> for this is that that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord make straight his path the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and uh, leathern girdle about his loins and his meat was locusts in the wilderness. Then went out all Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about to Judea and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, I, I will just catch that one later. Let me just first catch this scripture. Yeah, it should be in Luke chapter 1 from verse uh, 15. So I want to catch especially about Israel, the congregation. That one we shall come to it later. Uh, Luke 1 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord their God. When John the Baptist comes, the scripture says, many of the children of Israel shall be turned to their God.
Many of the children of Israel shall be turned to their God, the scripture says. Because the scripture that is addressed is specifically to Israel. God does not sin with confusion. When he sends Isaiah, he knows the prophecy to whom this Isaiah's prophecy is concerned with. For example, just go into Isaiah chapter 6. The prophet Isaiah gets his commission in chapter 6. Also, from verse 8, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who shall go for us? Then he said, Here I am, uh, here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell these people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the hearts of these people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and be converted, and be saved. They said, Lord, how long? As you keep down, who is this person that the word of the Lord is going to come to through Isaiah? God is saying in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which was so concerning Judah and Jerusalem. God always is always specific. When it comes to Isaiah, he sends him a vision. So the thing that he says, you cannot pin them over to the body of Christ, the Gentile. When I speak the body of Christ, of course, I know it contains both Jews and Gentiles. But though we knew no any man after the flesh, in this body, we are not known by our flesh. In him, in this new creature, there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. Being a Jew, being a barbarian, does not mean anything but a new creature, which has been made in this new man, Christ Jesus. So this is what I mean, where the Jew is not known or judged by the standard of a Jew. Where a Gentile is never no longer judged according to the standard of a Gentile. Because now peace has been made in this new body. So you cannot get some of the things that are being prophesied in the book of uh, Zachariah, or rather maybe in the book of uh, Malachi, where the Bible says, remember, this is the burden of the Lord to Israel. Remember now the law of the Lord concerning Israel. And then you point and pin them over to the body of Christ, that is the new creature. In the new creature, the law has been abolished. The commandments that was against us have been abolished. A new man has been made. When you go to the book of Jeremiah, he says, Jeremiah, I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then when you see the prophecies of Jeremiah, they are all concerning nations. When you go to Daniel, the angel comes, I've come to give you an understanding of thy people. These are 70 weeks that are determined for thy people, Israel. You cannot get 70 weeks of Daniel and pin them over to the body of Christ. My friend, they don't work. 70 weeks can't work in the body of Christ because God is specific. It's not an order of confusion. So when it comes to Malachi, it says that the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, it is Israel. And this Israel has not been repressed. It might have been blinded for the sake of the body of Christ program, but it has not been forgotten. All Israel should be saved. Where should this Israel be saved? We are going to go there. So now the, uh, the scripture says, Remember, now because of this, I'm going to send you, a, I'm going to send you, who is this you? It must still go with Israel, it is the you. Besides that, when you go to the scriptures, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says, a dispensation of the gospel was committed to him to preach to you Gentiles. This dispensation, this dispensation was kept secret, hidden God, Never known to the sons of man. So the gospel that Paul preaches was never known to the sons of man. You cannot go to the book of Malachi and you want to get the gospel of Paul from there. It was never known to him. Malachi knew about remembering the law of the Lord. The gospel that was kept sacred says Christ is the end of the law. God has abolished the law which was contained in ordinances. These are two diverse programs. You Branhams, learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. Learn where you have been called for participation and not for participation, but just for instructions. For you to understand what God has been dealing with. <clears throat> the things we pray, we, 
we read, so we can be instructed in the word of righteousness. But when it comes to doctrine, you cannot take the body of Christ and doctrinize them on what Malachi is speaking. You will be wrong. You will be found a confusion. You will be bringing confusion in the body of Christ. A reproach. As if God is the author of it. He is not the author. So, remember, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. I will send you this prophet and he shall do this work. Now let's go to the birth of first the question that was asked Christ when they went to the mountain should be in uh, Matthew 17. Matthew 17, something great has happened. And the brethren have been called James, John, and Peter. And Christ has been taken on the mountain and has been transformed. Peter later gets this experience of mountain transfiguration and he calls it the power and the coming. As long as the king is in the land, now they should preach the kingdom of God is at hand. And he takes this experience that they saw on the mountain in the book of uh, 1 Peter. He calls it, brethren, we never expect you cunningly devised, devised fables. But we made known unto you the power and the coming of Christ when we was with him in the holy mount. For he received such witness from the Father when he had this excellent voice. This is my beloved son of whom I am well pleased to dwell in. So Peter gets the experience and he calls it the time of coming of Christ. The power and the coming. Power because this king whom they have been having all this day, all the long, all these years of their knowledge to him, they have never seen him in such a glory. So the son of man should one day come with his glory. For the spirit that was in the prophets prophesied of two things according to the book of Peter. It testified of the sufferings of Christ and the glorification of Christ. The spirit of Christ that was in the prophets prophesied about the sufferings of Christ. So meaning, the spirit of Christ was always there. It is God's Holy Ghost. You Trinitarians. It was God's Holy Ghost in the prophets. Prophesied about the sufferings again of Christ. That's why Christ had to be made fresh. The word has to be made fresh. So it can do suffering part. But after that one, now I come from God, I go back to God. Whilst it is in the spirit, now he is coming in glory. The same Jesus shall return, now not for sin, but for salvation. No more for suffering, but for the work of salvation. Here he is not calling for sinners to repent. He is coming to fulfill his uh, his word which he promised to Israel and the rest of the nations to receive the blessings and to finish with his enemies when you see him come in the clouds the second time as he was received up by a cloud to heaven. Now the spirit is divided of these things. Now when Peter is speaking about them, he says this experience we saw in mountain transfiguration is not just a spirit experience of uh, expression but it is presenting the power and the coming and in the power and the coming the Bible says he incorporated two olive trees according to the book of Zechariah what is now Zechariah I see two olive trees what are these two olive trees they drain their oil into a golden stand lampstand the two olive trees and then he says, what does these things mean? He says, these are the two witnesses that stand by the Lord of the earth. So when the Lord of the earth comes, when the Lord himself comes, when the owner, the one that has rightful possession of the earth, when he that is able to open the seals, to take the book and become Lord over the earth, he that created the heavens and the earth, when he comes, then there are two olive trees that are supposed to stand by the Lord of the earth. And this is what Zechariah saw as the two olive trees that was giving oil to the love sun. That's why we have to find ourselves that in the coming, in the revelation of Jesus Christ, 
which Peter spake in the chapter 1, I said that, wait for the grace that is to be brought unto thee at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When the revelation of Jesus Christ is come, then the two olive trees are supposed to drain the oil into the seven golden candlesticks, in this case, the seven churches of the book of Revelations, that should be there in the times of the refreshing of Israel. Now, that is a bit higher for a Branhamite to hear. Because we have always had so many beliefs among us. But now, we want to take scripture by scripture, put scripture where it belongs. Write it by it. Now, what is happening on the mountain is, it is the coming of Christ. Now, if it is the coming of Christ, it can't be the first coming through the virgin. It has to be the second coming. And in this second coming, his eyes must shine like lightning. His face must be more brighter than the sun. His raiment must be so much brighter than the sun. His feet must be as brass. This person should have had another appearance altogether. What you see in Rev uh, Revelation chapter 1 and what you see on mountain transfiguration it is the same individual. It is the same person whom Daniel should have seen when he was struck, when he saw him brighter than the sun and he fell down until he touched him to strengthen him. He must be the same vision. The same vision that was seen by Daniel, the same vision must be seen by the three apostles and the same vision must be the same vision of the book of Revelations chapter 1 about the coming of Christ. And in the coming of Christ, the Bible says, and after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up into the high mountain, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was whiter as light. Take that person and compare him with the person of the book of Revelation, chapter 1. He is the same person. Take that person whose eyes are so like the lightning, and speak to him, uh, compare him with the same person that was in one of the church, churches whose eyes are like the lightning. He must be the same individual. Same individual. Now the Bible says, and behold, in that kind of experience, the Bible says, and behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. The two olive trees of the book of Zechariah that stand by the, Lord, by the Lord of the earth, they appeared to him, talking to him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here thee three tabernacles, one for thee, another for Moses, and another for Elijah. And when he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my blood, son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces as were so afraid. The same thing that happened to, uh, to, to John. The same thing that happened to, uh, to Daniel, the same thing happens to these three disciples. They were so, so afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. This was a vision. Something is supposed to happen. Something. Speak about the future which Peter calls the power and the coming. Tell this vision to no man until now that he has died and resurrected. Now you can tell them, friends, we did not make known unto you the fables, but it we told you about the power and the coming. When we was with him, he had this experience. Now, when they came, and his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the stripes and the liars are so, so stripes that the liars must first Come. When they saw the coming of Christ, now they became concerned. Why does the scribes, the teachers of the law, speak that Elias must come, first come? Jesus, in answering, he says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. 
So, Elijah, who is being promised, taught by these uh, scribes, is the messenger of restoration. Is a prophet who is supposed to do restore. He's a prophet of restoration. Why is he saying that now he should first come? Then he says, Elijah should surely first come and restore all sins. Now, you preachers, have all things been restored yet? Or it is supposed to be future? When God speaks about the Elijah that is supposed to come, when I speak about Elijah that is ahead of them, then he speak about restoration of all things. Then he adds and says, But I said unto you, that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise, shall the Son of Man suffer of them. The disciples understood that he spake out them of John the Baptist. Now, this scripture cannot be a fake. When this Elijah that was promised to Israel, when the question comes to Jesus, he says, Elijah must first come and restore all things. So he must come in the times of restitutions, restitution of all things. He must first Come and restore all things. But I say unto you, he has also come. So there must be two comings of Elijah. So the Elijah that is promised in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, and then verse 5, but I send Elijah, the prophet, for the coming of the great day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the children to the fathers, lest I come as by the of the cast, he must first come and restore all things. And I say unto you that he has already come. So who is this one that has already come so far? The one that has already come, we find him in the book of Luke, chapter 1. From verse 17. <clears throat> Now, from verse 15 he says, For he shall be great, who? Speak about John. In the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine, nor strong drink, and shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel, so meaning, if we speak about the children in concern, they must be the children of Israel. Many of the children of Israel. So it means the very thing of fathers and children, it must be identified thus. Because you, it is Israel. I said you, Elijah the prophet, it must be Israel. Because the burden was about Israel. It was not about this new body. It was not about the mystery of Christ. It was about Israel. So, many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord, their God. Why? Isaiah 40, from verse 3. Malachi chapter 3. I send the messenger of the covenant, whom you light in. He shall make ready a people for the Lord. So now, many of the children of Israel shall be turned to their God. I'm specific. Remaining with the congregation. Brother, the reason is you cannot take some of the things that Paul preached and you pin them over to the nation of Israel. It cannot work. If you ever tell Israel as a nation that now Christ is the end of the law, they will never receive you. To them they are promised that they must have a new covenant and it must be a law written in their hearts. Now to you, you have been called to the fellowship of the mystery where the enemy of the law has been abolished. 
These are two congregations all together. Don't mix them up. So now that's why the Bible says, he many of the children of Israel, who are the children, Israel. Now when we speak about children, being the children of Israel, then the Romans speak and say, chapter 9, Many of the children of Israel were the children Israel. Then, Romans chapter 9, what does it say? It says, Who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, whose are the fathers? Israel, to whom are the fathers? So when he says, I shall change the hearts of the fathers. Israel are the children. Many of the children of Israel. Israel, to whom are the fathers? Why can that one be clear to you? Branhams, don't you think that you are the first people to propagate an Elijah to come? No, sir. In 1980, rather in 1847 to 1905, rather 1907, a man by the name of Frank, eh, by the name of Alexander Dowie, because he performed miracles, he had already started claiming that he is an Elijah, Elijah the prophet. In 1862 to 18 to 1958. A man called Frank Sanford. He was also, also claiming that he was an Elijah because he was performing miracles. So when you saw Bradham saying that there has been Elijah mantles and Elijah courts, but there is going to be a true spirit of Elijah, and that the Elijah of this day is the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing. Elijah is promised and shall restore all things, then Christ should come. So you are not promised Jesus to come, restore all the things, and then Jesus come. You are a liar there. Many have claimed. But who are the people who are the fathers? Many of the children of Israel shall be turned on the Lord. And Israel, my kingdom according to the flesh, Paul speaking, to whom also pertains the fathers. You, the new body, you were without fathers. You have been accepted only, only, and only in Christ. In Him, you have acceptance, according to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. The adoption, your adoption is in Christ. Theirs, they are beloved for their father's sake. They are enemies for your sake. But for their father's sake, they are beloved. You never had the fathers, you body of Christ. For in the time past, you were without fathers. You are without God in the world. Why can't you come to time and trust scriptures? Are they too heavy for you? Must you have the respect for a man other than what the scripture is speaking? God is no respect of persons. You can respect, but God has no respect because you respect. God respects one thing, that is his word. So this trash, rubbish, of Elijah mantles and Elijah claims, of Malachi claims in the body of Christ, remove it. Take away the exception. God hates deceivers. Don't deceive the people. Malachi chapter 3 speaks it. It says, God hates people who are deceitful. Hmm? Should be there somewhere. Go, Malachi. Chapter 3. Somewhere. Just get scared, maybe catch it later. But God hates deceivers. Doesn't want us to be deceitful. If you are going to do the work of the Lord, please do it without exceptions amongst you. What profit is it for you to claim something when you are just building hay and stamp upon Christ? So many of the children of Israel are going to the book of Luke shall be turned to the Lord, their God. 
So when John the Baptist comes, he is not sent to the body of Christ. Because to begin with, the program of the body of Christ had not yet come. Because Christ had to first die, resurrect, give or meet Paul, and give him the revelation of the message to bring the body of Christ, a new creature. Preach about the restored man and the new creature. The new creature is new. Nothing new above or under the sun, but the new creation. Catch the head of it. Israel, their salvation, will not make a new creature. It will be a restoration of a certain woman that left her position, according to the book of Hosea. She should be restored. It is she that has the covenants. It is she that needs an Elijah to restore her. You don't preach restoration to a new creation. Where was it ever in God that it fell and now it needs a restoration? You never was in God to begin with. You never had God. You were without Christ. They had Christ. They had the promises. They had the covenants. They fell. They need to be restored. You never had them. What God does is he creates you a new and makes you to become a body, or rather a member in this new man. The new man is the Lord from heaven and your members of this new body. Scripture should be satisfying. No wonder the Bible says whatever was written was written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures we should have hope. And this hope should be a rightful hope. Love of God. Love of the word of God. Bring us the comfort of these scriptures. Many of the children of Israel should be turned unto the Lord. Then he says, And he shall go before him in the spirit of in the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. So meaning, the fathers were there <coughs> and the children were there when John's message went forth. You Branhamites, you cannot make the Pentecostals to be the fathers intended in the book of Malachi. The fathers were the Israelites, fathers, patriarchs. Things that were promised the prophets. The faiths they had. The heart. And the heart goes with what was promised. They were promised a new covenant. They were promised a kingdom. They were promised the turning out of ungodliness from Jacob. They were promised a deliverer. These people had the promises, had the heart, had the faith. Now what was promised to the fathers ought to be given to the children. That's why when John comes on the scene, chapter 3 of Matthew, he begins preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the people throughout Judea and all Jerusalem came to him. And also the Pharisees, they came to him. And when John saw them, he says, You brood of vipers who had warned you of the wrath that is supposed to come. Now the axe is laid upon the root. Every tree that bringeth not fruit should be held down because he was introducing the salvation of Israel as it was promised to Zachariah that behold, he is supposed to come and introduce the salvation of Israel. What was promised the fathers has now to come to pass. So the fathers, where are they? And the children, where are they? And you are the children. Speak about Israel. Because the burden is specific to Israel. That's when John came. He never went to the Gentiles. If he went there, then what about Christ? The very Christ that he, has, he, was, he had introduced, the scripture says, when he even sends his disciples in Matthew 10, he says, don't go to the old Gentiles. Go out to the sheep of Israel. Preach them the kingdom of God is at hand. When Christ in Matthew chapter 5, I think, he preaches, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Chapter 3, John preaches, the kingdom of God is at hand. Because these people were waiting for a visible kingdom to come on this earth. And the king was already in the land. And once the king is in the land, you can preach salvation because now the king is there to give them salvation. 
But the body of Christ, you won't preach to them salvation unless Christ should have given the blood, making peace, taking away the enemy of the law, and now after his death and resurrection, now you can cross over, because now the enemy has been done away with, God can now search out those who are now aliens. Diverse programs of God. These are not my words. They are the scriptures. So meaning, John the Baptist fulfilled the Elijah that has come. When Christ speaks and says that Elijah shall surely come, and I tell you, Elijah is already come. The Elijah who has come is John the Baptist. And he turned the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the body of Christ then was accept. The new creature was accept. You was accept. It was Israel coming to our promises. Because Malachi says, the burden of the world not to Israel by Malachi. God is specific. Daniel, for thy people. So you can take the 70 weeks and put them to the body of Christ. It is to thy people. When he speaks about the laws in Leviticus 25, verse 8, about the jubilees of the Lord. Those jubilees pertain to Israel, it's part of the law. That's why when you put them over to the body of Christ, you fail, you Branhamite. When Branham got those jubilees and said that 70 jubilees are yet to be ended in 1977, he failed because he was lying. That is the problem to Israel, not to the body of Christ. Not to you. So you also are found liars, false witnesses of the scripture because you have false claims. Why? Some form of religious ostentation to put something to look as if it is more different variable so you can have your own something. So Elijah, which was, has already come, is already come. That was John the Baptist, fathers to children. But Christ said, he shall first come and restore all things. So there must be also another Elijah of restoring all things. Matthew 17. There is another future Elijah who is supposed to come and restore all things. And this Elijah of restoring all things, we should find him now being spoken over in the book of Acts chapter 3, being spoken over in the book of Revelations chapter 11. That is when all things are supposed to be restored. And, let us go slowly. Restoring all things. Acts chapter 3. From verse 18. Three from verse 18. Let's look at what the scripture speaks about the Elijah that he should supposed to come. You see this William Branham, the one which is in the future, must he come to the body of Christ. Let's read the scriptures. Verse 18. <coughs> Now, Peter is addressing on the road Pentecost. He's addressing these brethren. From verse 7 says, Now, brethren, I want that through ignorance you did it, as also your rulers. He spinned to Israel. Through ignorance, they crucified or murdered or killed the Prince of Peace. Israel is guilty of murdering or killing the Prince of Peace. Then the body of Christ will grow in the cross. Two people. Some are guilty because their guilt is the coming of him shows they never fulfilled the law of the Lord, which they promised in Exodus 19. That the thing thou hast spoken, we will do. But their failure to do it is reflected on Christ's coming to fulfill it. So when he comes to take away the curse, they kill him. And they are guilty. Now Peter is speaking. Now I want that through ignorance you did it, as also also did your rulers. But those things which God before has shown by the mouth of his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. The prophets spilled in them of Christ 
prophesying about the suffering, he has now fulfilled. David speaking, they pierced my hands. They pardoned my garment. I just speaking, the servant in whom I delight in. Then they wounded him for our transgression. With his stripes we are healed. About the suffering of Christ, Christ had to come and fulfill them. But because these Pharisees couldn't rightly divide suffering from glory, they were expecting the Jesus of the glory and not looking on the Jesus or the Christ who is supposed to come and suffer. For this reason, they missed him. He became a stumbling block. He became a rock of offense that the builders rejected. And he fell upon them and they were ground to powder. And he told them, unless you believe that I'm he, you shall die in your sins. And they died in their sins. Why? Because they couldn't divide rightly about the suffering and the glorification. And they are waiting for the Jesus of the glorification. But the Jesus of the suffering, they didn't know how to identify him scripturally. John Peter is telling them that this same Jesus, he has fulfilled the things about his suffering. Now he says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times, when the refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When are these people's sins supposed to be blotted out? The Bible says, when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, here it's not famous. It is here a little, there a little, that the man of God should not lack anything. Now let me just catch another scripture here. Now in Peter chapter 1 verse 8 he's speaking over of course you understand Peter is addressing his episode to those children, the strangers who were scattered. It's the same congregation. Don't mix it up. And he says whom having not seen, you love whom have whom though, uh, though now you see him not, yet receiving uh, believing, you, you rejoice with, your, with joy and speak, but full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched out diligently, who prophesied of the grace, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you, that should come to you, searching what or what manner of time the spill of Christ which was in them did signify when testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should fall after. Unto whom it was revealed, and not unto them also themselves, but unto us that they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look unto. Therefore, wherefore, guard up your wounds. The ends of your mind, be sober and hope to the end. Verse 13. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hope to the end for the grace that is supposed to be brought unto you at the revelation of of Jesus Christ. Peter is speaking about something future. Grace is supposed to be brought to Israel at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. Uh, John to the seven churches which are in Asia grace be to you and peace from him which is which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before the throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the 
first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, at him that he has loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. When Christ comes, he speaks about grace unto you. From him that was, that is, and is come, from the seven spirits, from Jesus Christ. There is no way in the letters of Paul where Paul was ever addressing the body of Christ and he spoke about the grace from the seven spirits. And Paul says, I never shun to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So there is a people, in short, that are supposed to receive grace. And this will be at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Seven weeks are determined to make an end of sin, to do away with iniquity, to anoint the most holy, to seal up vision and prophecy. This event of Daniel, this event which Peter is calling hope to the end, for the grace that is supposed to be brought unto at the revelation of Jesus Christ. They are all future, fulfilling what is being spoken in the book of Acts, chapter 3, from verse 18. Verse 19 now. 18. Repent therefore, 19, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive. Jesus will be sent to you, whom the heavens must receive, until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. My friend, if the thing is to be restored, were spoken by the prophets since the world began. They can't be the same things that were spoken or that were kept secret since the world began. Paul speaks about the unsearchable riches, never known to the sons of men, hid, in the pro- hid from the prophets, hid in God, Never known or hid from generations and ages, and they were never known since the foundation of the world. And they were given to him to preach the unsearchable riches. But Peter preaches the things that the prophets searched out and required and inquired of the salvation that is supposed to be brought to you that was promised since the world began. These are two gospels to diverse programs. So the restitution of all things that Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 17, which should cause Elijah to come, and the restitution of all things, which Peter is speaking, that must Jesus remain in heaven until they are restored. They are spoken by the prophets, given to them as promises, speak, uh, spoken since the world began. They are two diverse programs. So the future, Elijah, is supposed to restore things that were spoken since the world began. The time of restitution that is promised to Israel, the grace that is supposed to come to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ, the grace they are supposed to receive, when Christ is supposed to come from heaven, set after this restitution, he is not coming to the body of Christ, but he is coming to Israel, who had the prophets prophesying since the world began. So, it can't be a man ministering to the body of Christ, or else someone is subverting your faith from his, him that has called you to the gospel kept secret. From him that has called you, from the gospel kept secret, revealed to Paul, a dispensation that was given you. If someone is subverting your faith, from that faith, 
to another faith then could that be true but if it is that your candidates of the message of Paul the dispensation of the grace of God the gospel of the grace of God that has appeared to all men teaching them denying ungodliness the grace that has already appeared whom it is spoken that salvation is today and to whom salvation of Israel must come future for the Bible says a deliverer should come but it should be after the body has been raptured into this sacred air that we have spoken then it will come to pass that whoever claims that is this fulfillment of Elijah of children to the fathers must be speaking to you a lie from the pits of hell what have you spoken brother Redeemer yes when Branham speaks that his ministry is fulfilling Elijah to the body of Christ and is quoting Malachi 4, he lied you. Why? Because the scripture does not speak that. And if the scripture speaks, let every mouth shut and every heart bleed. So, the Elijah that is supposed to come, he must come at the restitution of all things. These are two olive trees which were seen with the Lord of the earth when he stood on the mountain olives and he was transfigured before his disciples. These are two olive trees which are supposed to come now in the book of Revelation chapter 11. Here is scripture, friends. Someone told me, brother, that is private interpretation. God interprets his word. He a little, there a little. If your program confuses the whole, the whole thing, then leave it. Go about the scriptures. Verse 3, Revelations chapter 11. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand and two hundred and three score days closed in two in sacros. These two witnesses are the two, these are the two olive trees and the, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Zechariah chapter 4. These are the two witnesses fulfilling Zechariah chapter 4. Let me just read it for you here. Because it is all the program of God. From verse 11. Then answered I and said, at him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And he answered and said, and I answered again, and said unto him, and I answered again, and, and said unto him, what these, what be these two olive trees, these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty their golden oil out of themselves? And he answered, that was the angel that was showing Zechariah the vision. And he answered and said unto me, and he said, Knowest thou not what this be? I said, Nay, my Lord. Then said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the earth. Two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the earth. And I will give my power unto my two witnesses. These are two anointed ones. I'll give my power to the two witnesses. Anointed ones. Power to my two witnesses. And they prophesy those a thousand and two hundred and three score days. Closing sacros. The two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man had them, 
and fire shall proceed out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it should not rain in the days of their prophecy and have power over the water to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that sends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. You Branhamites. Where is Sodom expected? As it was in the days of Sodom, so should it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. That's why your Luke 17.30 goes. Your Luke 17.30, it is not all robots. It is not Bill Abrahams. It is not this your William Branham. No, my brother. It is two olive trees, two anointed ones, who stand by the Lord of the earth, that were with him on mountain transfiguration, Elijah and Moses, when it was in the times of the power and the coming. That's why after their prophecy, then comes 15, verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there are great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this earth are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign over of the, uh, reign forever and ever. The kingdoms of this earth, the Lord of the earth, has taken his rightful position. Because these two witnesses, after the days of their prophecy, there should be nothing remaining but the return of the king. For the kingdom, he is the Lord of the earth. That's where we expect Luke 17, 30. So should it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. The grace that is supposed to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The grace has to be brought to Israel in turning away from and goodness from Jacob. And now when the grace comes, they that pierced him should also mourn as one mourneth for his firstborn. The family of Judah alone, the family of what alone, and they shall say to him, where get you these wounds in your hands? And he shall speak unto them, I got them from the house of my friend, Joseph, making himself known to his brethren. Friends, if such scriptures are not sufficient for you to recognize that it is an error to teach a Malachi for to the body of Christ, when even the scripture says the burden of the word of the Lord of the, to Israel by Malachi, and yet you still refuse because you have that kind of thought of accelerating a scripture in the old text so that you can point out your own wishes. That should never be like that. So, these people come in the times of refreshing. These two witnesses come in the times of refreshing. They come and prophesy in the first part of the 70th week of Daniel. Of course, I'm so sure when Branham confused you up, he first spoke that the 70th week, that the 70 weeks was future. 70th week was future. That was, of course, when he was prioritizing Larkin's notes. Then he later now comes and turns over to Smith's version. Then he says, now the 70th week, part of it has been preached. Why can't you speak the truth? Why should two things contrary proceed from your mouth? Why should you have lying lips the Lord hates? The whole 70th week is future. And it should begin by the seventh, two witnesses preaching. Giving a fresh chance to Israel. Those are the times of refreshing. When Jesus is supposed to be sent from heaven. After the testimony of the two witnesses. Grace must be come to these people. In those days. Though the number of the children of Israel. 
should be many as the sons of the sea, but the remnant should be saved. Then, Revelation chapter 7, from the house of Dan, 12,000, from the house of Joseph, 12,000, 144,000 are selected. Many are called, but a few are chosen. Then the bridegroom comes, and those who are ready, the 144,000, enter in at the marriage. Then there are they which follow the Lamb whosoever he goes. 144,000, Revelations 14. They are pure, they are clean. They never define themselves with women. Christ is coming back on Mount Olives, and is supposed to judge now the nations. Zechariah 14. Read the scriptures. The time of refreshing comes and catches a chosen number of the children of Israel. As soon as Zion travaileth, she brings forth. When the half of the 70th week is finished, these two witnesses are killed. Then the spirit is given to them and they are raptured in heaven. The angel was preaching. Whoever shall take on the mark of the beast, should be made to drink of the wrath, of the cup of the wrath of, of Christ. And the people refuse that mark. That is the times when the Jews are deceived. In the first part of the 70th year, 70th week, the Jews are deceived. The Antichrist seated in the temple, exalted as, the, as God. In the middle of the week, he is supposed to cut his covenant that he made with the Jews. Then he holds the red, I mean, he, the, 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 he holds the, the sword and kills whosoever doesn't have the mark. Friends, that is the allegory of the scriptures. So, the time of the refreshing that Peter is speaking is this time which is called future, wherein Elijah should come. The Elijah that is supposed to come is this Elijah who is now in the second coming of Christ. And he must restore all things. In this case, he comes with Moses and Moses. They smite the earth with plagues. But they restore all things. Until the 144,000 captures the message. And the nation is born. That is supposed to receive the promises. The spirit now is poured upon that flesh. What was, what was spoken in Joel that is supposed to restore all things. What was eaten by the canker on the caterpillar. Now you can preach restoration to Israel. They are restored back to the faith of the fathers. Now the children to the fathers. Here there is no body of Christ. Why? By the time of those prophecies, the 70th week, the mystery of Christ is supposed to have been done away with. It must have translated you into the other air, which does not know distance. Yes. That's why we shall be gathered to meet the Lord in that air. The air wherein those angels were gathered around Elisha. That's where we are going. When this earthly tabernacle is dissolved, have one waiting. Moto shall put on immortality. So friends, the times of restitution of all things hoped to come to Israel. I hope that is kind of clear. So pertaining Elijah and William Branham and the end time message claims, friends, you better go back to the scripture. God is not the author of confusion. He's the author of order. He knows his congregations. When he speaks to the body of Christ, you cannot impute some of the things being spoken over to the body of Christ and you put it over to the 144,000. That's why they are being saved later after you have been raptured. That's why they are born as a nation. 
They are future. But your salvation is today. Take the people preacher. Put them to the right faith. And whoever will come to the listening of this, take your time. Say, but I read in my head. I don't like him. Some of them told me they prayed that I should die. I'm alive still to fulfill the purpose. If the purpose will be done, then I should go. But this is the scriptures. Put the people the right faith. The Lord bless you so much. Elijah. Not got so much of the time to go through all the quotes that William Branham spoke. But you know how he promised, how he was quoting, that is the Elijah is everything, that now the Elijah is no longer a certain preacher, now is Jesus Christ. For what reason are you planting all those things? Paul laid the foundation, and you're adding or building thereupon. Be careful. If you lay an Elijah ministry of restoration upon the foundation which Paul builded, that is hay, that is wood, that is trash, it must burn. Judge yourselves. Consider what I say. Paul speaks. Consider what I say. Timothy, consider what I say. That is a faithful saying. God bless you so much. Thank you, precious Father, for the few moments that we've had of sharing. May you bless them, keep them, Father. And may you make the people to understand. May they know that the reason is not to fight no man, but rather to put the people back to the right track. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen.